Indonesia's Papuan province contains the most hazardous terrain and weather conditions in the country, and it's home to some of the most dangerous landing strips in the world. They're at their most treacherous in the high altitudes and ultimate remoteness around the Papuan highlands of Wamena. For Suzy Air pilots, flying these routes is seen as the ultimate challenge. And one adrenaline junkie, Danny Milan, is desperate to take on. For me, like I think it's important to to move up always in life because if 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 you stay at one level, um, I think I'll get really bored. This is no place for rookies. Pilots have to prove themselves time and time again before they can fly these routes. Don't sink. And only the very best get to take on the perilous airstrips. <laughs> The 26-year-old South African Danny left his homeland in search of adventure and is determined to make the most of his time in Indonesia. Come and fly in Papua in the mountains here. It is a big challenge, but I like it. It, it keeps me awake. Having worked for Suzy Air for three years, today Danny is taking a test to prove he's up to flying the extreme routes from Wamena. He'll be under the watchful eye of veteran British pilot Steve Walton. Keep point 3,800 feet. Basically, if I get this one more mountain strip ticked off, that'll mean I've been to all the mountain strips we've got here out in Papua. So it'll be a big accomplishment. To pass, Danny must execute a perfect flight, landing the 12-seater Cessna caravan in the small mountain village of Holowan, over 30 miles away. It is a test of his skill as a pilot and his nerves. The guys in Papua have to be at the top of their game. It does require a lot of training. Even small mistakes can claim lives. Pilots get too comfortable and then they slip up. A little bit nervous with Steve looking at me, make sure I do everything correctly by the books. Um, yeah, so definitely a little bit of pressure there. The test will take place under full flight conditions with a plane full of passengers on board. Sky traffic perfect, the is now rolling. Holowan is renowned for its strong winds, which frequently blow planes off course towards the surrounding mountains. It's one of the most notorious approaches in Papua. Some trips you, you can't go in after 10 o'clock, otherwise history tells us that it's too windy and people crash, so we just don't go in. Have there been any air crashes over here? Uh, we had one crash, yeah. Um, but I don't particularly want to talk about that at the moment. There have been three fatal crashes in Suzy Air's 10-year history, but it was the crash nearest to the Wamena base that affected Steve and Danny most personally. Most of us in Suzy have lost somebody. Well, two and a half years ago, we, we all lost somebody. Um, quite a close mate who actually did his training with me. There's a few plane wrecks out there in the mountains and uh, that's kind of a constant reminder to be careful out there. One of them was one of my best friends and I still miss him today. We had three accidents in really short succession. It affected almost everybody. Um, morale was really low, it made us question what we do. I'm pretty sure my friend um, would have wanted me to keep on flying. Pushing limits, that's, that's what we like to do, and uh, that's what I'm constantly trying to do. For pilots like Danny, the challenging conditions are what make flying in Papua so exhilarating. Seven miles to the uh, southeast of the field, 4,500 feet, joining by the overhead. As they approach the strip, the dangers are immediately apparent. Holowan is one of the narrowest and steepest strips for a caravan to land on in Papua. With its poorly maintained condition, it leaves Danny with no room for error. Land too early, and he will hit the rough, rocky surface at the front of the strip. Land too late, and he won't have time to bring the plane to a halt before the thick stone wall at the end of the runway. I have got passengers on board, but if at any point I tell you to go around, just go around. Unless, obviously, you've called committed. Yep. 500. Right, second so phoenix approach. Fuel tanks, both on terrain switch is inhibited. That's full. Right, now ground 
Steve isn't happy with Danny's approach. If he maintains this altitude, he will land too far along and run out of track. How does the profile look to you now? Still looks a bit high, still a little bit high, okay. A little bit too high, man. Feels all right to me. Let's just do a go around, yeah? All right, let's go around. It's a little bit high, and we'll come in again. At the last minute, Steve aborts the landing, instructing Danny to make a second attempt. Keep an eye on the runway, and I'll give you speed on final. If Danny doesn't impress Steve with his next approach, he may miss out on his dream of joining the select few Suzy Air pilots qualified to fly these routes. This to the line. Watch out for that wind. Watch out, slow down. <laughs> Danny's brought the plane down safely and smoothly. Yeah, I'm stoked. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty happy um, getting this one done. I think I'll be comfortable flying in here on a regular basis um, with the passengers and a, and a normal co-pilot. Um, so yeah, I feel, I feel pretty good about it already. But it's Steve who'll decide whether Danny's done enough to progress to the ultimate challenge of flying these strips. A bit high on the approach. Um, but we corrected that when it did go around on the first one, and it, that was all fine. It's good. It's always good to see the go around as well. He can self-check himself, empty into more mountain strips in the future, and then from there, we're always good to go. Danny is now ready for a move to Wamena to join the Suzy Air Elite, but for now he's returned to his base in Nabire. He shares a house with four other Suzy Air pilots. They're all single. Balancing a family life with a job is next to impossible. I really would love to go back home maybe one year or two years from now. I'm looking for a girlfriend to start off, and hopefully for the future, a family. Nearly all the Suzy Air pilots are under the age of 30. But grandfather Robin Rudderham is the exception. <laughs> At the age of 54, after his marriage broke down, Robin from Essex left behind friends, family and a job as a plumber to make a completely new start. At the time, I'd uh, already got my private pilot's license and I thought, why not uh, turn your hobby into a job? To be honest with you, I feel like a, a big 25-year-old, really, uh, reliving my youth out here with the guys. I miss my uh, children and my family. I quite often get phone calls from my daughter saying, Dad, why don't you come back home? But I want a challenge, and that's what I'm here for. For the last four months, Robin's been flying in the built-up lowlands of Papua, ferrying commuters along the monotonous lowland route between the towns of Biak and Serui. After you've done it sort of four times a day, six days a week, it becomes a little bit tedious. So now Robin's heart is set on taking the huge step up to flying the dangerous yet exciting routes in the mountains. As housemate Danny is fully qualified as a mountain captain, he's going to mentor Robin on his first mountain flight. Once Robin's proved he has the necessary skills, he can then apply to move up to Danny's level. Some of these strips are, are real tricky, like you can put yourself in a really, really uh, dangerous position Good luck, Rob. I think you're going to need it. The BAA Public Key Label Victor Sierra is now ready for departure on runway 34. Thank you for the takeoff. Danny may be less than half Robin's age, but in the mountains, he's the veteran and Robin's his apprentice. Like, if it's your first time in the mountains, you take it slow, man. Like, 
I generally, I'd set up the aircraft at a slow airspeed, take my time, especially the mountains, there's no rush. Big learning curve. It's like going thing. from the primary school to the back, back to yeah, high school. school. So you're lastly in primary school, you think you know everything, and you're yeah. back, back to level yeah. one again. That's right. Halfway into their journey from Nabiri to Fawi, there's a stark reminder of how badly things can go wrong as they fly over Pogapa, the site of two recent crashes involving other airlines. Yeah, this is where the guys had the accident. Now I can see clearly now both aeroplanes and the airstrip. Yeah, so... Now you can quite clearly see it now, it's run off the side of the runway. Yeah. Um, and then the other aircraft at the top of the strip on the left hand side is another one that's up to grief. Difficult to make out but it do definitely looks like damage to the front there. As you know, now you can see that the surface isn't all the greatest. It's not, it's not you good, can no. Just imagine that with the slope as well. And if it's wet? How tricky that could be. It's quite daunting really to think how easy pilots have problems here. Sort of brings it home to you a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Just shows you how an airfield can catch you out here in the mountains. The crashes at Pogapa mean that it's not safe for caravan planes to land there. But the smaller, more nimble porter planes still do. Today, solo pilot Matt Dearden is making the journey with an aircraft packed full of rice and local Moni people. At school, I was the kind of geeky kid, you know, always on the computers, and to now be out here in this, like, paradise, basically, flying $2 million aircraft into the mountains and getting paid for it. I mean, you just wouldn't, I wouldn't even have imagined it when I was a kid at school. Um, and I suspect if any of, uh, any of my teachers are looking back at school now, they probably wouldn't have imagined that either. They would have probably imagined me sitting as I was in a nine-to-five IT job in Bristol. Don't sink. To land safely on the sloping airstrip at Pogapa, Matt has to slow the plane whilst battling the heavy tailwinds whipped up from the low valley to the left of the strip. But slow too much too soon, he risks stalling the plane and landing heavily. He doesn't want to end up the third crash on this strip. When you see a wrecked aircraft, it does bring it home, the risks out here. And uh, you know, if you get it a bit wrong, it could, you know, it could be the last thing you get wrong. down heavily on the rough surface. Oh, we've broken them, oh God. But Matt and the rest of the plane are intact. Yeah, that was a horrible approach, mate, horrible. Pogapa is a small mountain village of 400 Moni tribal people. But Matt isn't the only Westerner here. 62-year-old American John Cutts moved out to Papua with his parents when he was just a child. Hi, Matt. Hi. Matt. Matt, glad to meet you. My name's John. John, I've heard of you. I've heard, uh, you're, you're the guy who lives here, right? Well, I've been here. I've been here since I was two years old. Uh, grew up down valley and here and all the way over to Hitaripa, so been around for a long time. This was my first language, uh, the Moni language. That's, that's fantastic. Today's an important day in Pogapa. The local Moni people are amassing from the surrounding area to cast their vote in the national elections. With a keen interest in the tribal people, Matt takes advantage of meeting John to find out more. They come hooting and hollering and they kind of announce, we've arrived from this village, and then they dance around and everybody listens. And this is a group that just showed up and so now they're saying, we're here, we brought our votes and take a look at us, you know? I mean, you certainly wouldn't get anything like that in England. I mean, you know, you vote for Tory or Labour or anything like that, you know, yeah. you're not going to be dancing down the streets of London going, Tory, Tory, you know, <laughs> or anything Actually, like that. Actually, I don't know that any of our elections in any of our countries are quite as exuberant and in your face kind of like yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so. you know, it's, I've never seen anything like it. There are over 2,000 Moni people living in the surrounding mountains. 
Although contact with the outside world has provided them with resources they would never have had access to otherwise, for many, hunting with bows and arrows is still an essential part of their way of life. But some of the arrows are not for hunting animals. He says, we made this one for people. Oh, that's purely for people. And for, yeah, for, for war. They have very blunt ones that just have a blunt end on it right. here. That's the, to stun a bird like a bird of paradise. You don't want to get blood on it, and so sure, you just yeah. want to stun it. Okay. And then they've actually got these with barbs on them. They do that for the marsupials, what they call couscous marsupials. Yeah. It goes in, and then the marsupial has uh, hands, and they can actually pull it out. Oh, okay, and so okay, if they yeah, don't, yeah. if they use one of these, it'll just pull it out and keep on going. Whereas when it's got the barbs on, it's stuck it's in stuck there. It's stuck in there, and then that's, that's it, out. yeah, yeah. Constantly, every day, while you're out walking around the villages, hunting and stuff, they're, they're shooting at stuff, practicing. <laughs> Pressure's on. I know. <laughs> I feel for him. Great, <laughs> eh? He says, you see that animal? It's rolling over. <laughs> there you go. He's, uh, that was a good shot, and it's gone right on the ground there. While the men run the risk of being speared by an arrow in battle, Ancient custom dictates that women must make their own sacrifice for their loved ones. It's part of their culture when a close relative dies, they actually take it off at the second knuckle. Many times it's their kids that they're yeah, cutting yeah. their fingers off for. Oh, she said, this was my dad. And she said, this was one of my sons. Uh, I took my finger off for that. That's just... And you know, like, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What they used to do is they would take the finger and they would put a little hole in it and they would hang it around their neck. So they literally were carrying a dried finger around their neck oh for gosh. two or three or four years later. And it would be, yes. you would see people with these fingers dangling on their neck and you would know that that was their reminder of their relative that passed away. Yeah. 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 Working as a pilot in the remote tribal regions of Indonesia is one of the most exhilarating, rewarding jobs in aviation. But the job comes with sacrifices. We're probably going to expect a lot of traffic. Yeah. 56 year old divorcee Robin left behind children, grandchildren, and a stable job in plumbing to pursue his dream of flying in the mountains of Papua. It was a big wrench to leave. Um, it was. Yeah, I won't, uh, I won't deny that. But I'm not prepared to sort of sit in my rocking chair just yet. I want to live life and live life to the full. Today, he's being mentored by experienced mountain captain Danny in the hope of proving he's up to becoming a mountain captain himself. Danny is taking him along one of the region's most hazardous routes. Here you can see mountains right us, around us, left and right. Known as the freeway, the 140-mile-long valley between Nabire and Mulia is the busiest mountain route in the whole of Indonesia. Traffic! Traffic! Watch out for this guy. It's a far cry from the quiet routes Robin currently flies in Papua's lowlands. But you can see how fast it is, the closing yeah. rate between two aircraft. Yeah, look at the speed of that thing. Yeah. It's a tiny aircraft, that's why it looks like far away, but it's actually close. Many of the smaller aircraft using the freeway don't carry transponders, the device which allows them to appear on other planes' warning systems. So Robin and Danny are forced to keep an eye out. I think there is one of the helicopters that doesn't have the... Uh, it doesn't have a transponder. It does the boat. Let's keep the lights on so they can see us. It's all nice and good now, good weather. But just imagine the next flight we have a lot of cloud pulls up because it happens real quick in the mountains. So we can even have clouds between us and this guy when we, we won't have, have it visible at all. Traffic! Traffic! Right, let's go, there's traffic behind us rolling as well. There have been 128 crashes in just 20 years in Indonesia, and near misses are a regular occurrence on the freeway. I'm just going to stay right of track now. Yeah. This guy might even level off 85. But if he's to become a mountain captain, 
The father of three will face these dangers on a daily basis, something his children are increasingly concerned by. My family do worry about me. Some of the accidents and problems we have in Indonesia have get to hit the news back in the UK. I think my daughter wishes I was back home, uh, flying back home. The day has been an eye-opener for Robin and his first taste of the unique dangers of flying in the mountains. It is more risky, it's more challenging, it's dangerous. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, there you go, look, we can sit down here. Robin needs a lot more experience to move up to mountain captain, but he's more than happy with his decision to leave his life in the UK behind. It took a lot of courage, I think, to have a, such a big, fast change of lifestyle. I stuck my all into it and uh, stuck it out. And two years now in Indonesia, I'm absolutely loving it. It's uh, I've got no regrets whatsoever, none at all. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Yeah. Now I've been out here and sampled uh, what this country has to offer, uh, I'd, I'd like to stay here. I'm happy here doing what we're doing. Deep in the mountain heartland of Papua, Matt Dearden's landing in Topogapa has cost him a mudguard. He needs to remove it to avoid it becoming dislodged on his next flight. There you go. Another casualty of Papua. But he's lucky that's his only problem. Things went far worse for the pilots of the nearby wreckage of recent crashes. It's always a harrowing thing seeing this is, you know, a pretty new looking airplane. And uh, yeah, here's where it's uh, laid to rest. No passengers on board, just the, uh, the two pilots. Apparently they walked away, so they were pretty lucky for, for that. This must have come in pretty bloody hard. The left wing's got a feral dent in it, so it probably uh, got a bit of a twisting force there, and it's just cracked this window here. Crashes in Papua are unfortunately uh, frequent. Uh, I, you know, I have lost some good friends here. In fact, one of my best pilot friends was just killed in a plane accident two days ago. And uh, these are people who have spent their lives out here flying. And it's just a reminder that you really need to be hyper vigilant at all times when you're flying. Yeah, I mean, look at it there. I mean, the wing is obviously just shoved back and then it's just twisted the fuselage right at the, uh, the root of the wing there. Yeah, this plane is probably never going to fly again. Matt isn't the only visitor to the remote Muni village. Today, the national elections are being held. Rival villages from across the vast valley have descended on Pogapa to vote. Accusations of vote rigging between different factions have led to a tense face-off. And it doesn't take much for the situation to get out of hand. Crazy. Don't get hit. They're getting ready to crank up a rock fest here. They're all picking up rocks and winging them. Once there's blood, that's it. You will not be able to clear them off the runway, so... we got to get out of here. You don't want to get too close, because you will get hit. I have been on a rock fest here on this runway, hundreds of people throwing rocks. I tried to walk into the middle to stop it. They kept right on going. Matt decides to make a hasty exit. What a strange end to a, to, to a beautiful day. Um, yeah, there's a lot of tension in the air, I guess. I guess that's politics for you. You know, I've probably learned more then uh, than I've learned in the last year and a half out here flying in Papua. I mean, that's what makes life out here just so, so interesting, you know? Next time. Mountain pilot Matt has to deal with a passenger dispute. The guy sitting behind you with a machete, is, uh, he wants to get to his destination, so it's just part, part of living and uh, working in Papua. Family man Ashok comes face to face with a thunderstorm. The impact of, of something happening to me for, for my family would, would be terrifying. 